But you know, the point here being that um, as are an we still talking about anime because I'm thinking shame is <laughs> is an option. This week on Backward Compatible, Doc and Chris discuss the aging of audiences and how nostalgia and previously acquired tastes affect people's perceptions of media. Plus, impressions of Papers Please, Grow Home, and some new gaming innovations. The Backward Compatible podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 46 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined tonight by Doc. Hey, hey, everybody. And unfortunately, James is not able to join us this evening, so it will be the uh, the low-sodium Backward Compatible podcast with just me and Doc. Oh, I see what you did there. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> uh, but no, we, uh, nothing against Jim. We appreciate his, uh, his occasional saltiness, because it is saltiness, which adds uh, depth of flavor. And it's it, also uh, a preservative. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, Jim is definitely worth his salt here on this podcast. So. Amen. Here's to you, Jim. Yeah. As I drink my ca- uh, caffeine-free coffee. And I drink very low caffeine green tea. Mm. So, what are we talking about tonight, Chris? So the meaty topic of discussion is something that I've been thinking about for a little while now. And that is um, the aging of audiences. That is to say... What's that, Sonny? <laughs> hey, what are you saying? You're going whippersnapper, get off my lawn. Um... <laughs> The the idea that we come to like certain things uh, when we are younger, when we're kids, or even when we're adolescents, um, that as we grow up, we, we do start to see, um, if we're being objective, that they're kind of meant for younger audiences. Um, and we, even if we still like them, a lot of times it's based more out of nostalgia or understanding that, like, okay, so this isn't what appeals to me anymore, but I still like this point, this point, and this point. Um, but then when we, have, um, when we try to share these things with our contemporaries... Um, are, are people in our same age group who didn't grow up with that. Um, they're sometimes, uh, they, they find it too childish or they don't understand it or all these other little things that, um, you know, make us then get defensive about it, you know, and have to be like, well, here's why it's good and here's why I like it and all this different stuff, which uh, we'll get more into detail about kind of what we mean about this. But basically the idea that, um, for example, with anime, you know, you grow up liking anime and a lot of people, as you get older, are like, anime, that's weird, you know? <laughs> so You're talking about game candy. Game candy? Well, it's something that's really sweet. Whenever you're young, you like it. And when uh, you get old, you eat three pieces and suddenly you're sick and you vow never to steal from your one-year-old again. Gotcha. Not... Not a not a specific story or anything. <laughs> no, nothing uh, nothing inspiring that for sure. Yeah, or, I'm sure. Uh, so anyway, uh, before we get into that though, we have our usual opening segment. So we'll go ahead and open with the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I recently played through Papers Please. Um, I had actually played it fairly near to its original release. Um, I played. A few days into it, the day game is basically broken up into days as levels, um, and I got to a point where uh, I made a mistake and I got uh, arrested, <laughs> and my game was over. Um, How sad for you. Yes. And then uh, recently I picked it up again and actually managed to play all the way through the game. Um, maybe not what some people might consider the best ending, but I do know I got ending number 20 out of 20, which means I guess I survived as long as I could have. Or the game went on. Oh, is that what it means? Okay. <laughs> I assume. Um, but anyway, Papers, Please is a really interesting game. It's uh, an indie game, and it is um, you play as a border checkpoint um, official uh, in a like 1982, I think, uh, fictional communist country, socialist country. Uh, I think it's called Arstroska. Ar- Arstroska. Um, Stan. <laughs> not not a stand. A stand. Um, I think it, I think it's supposed to be um, East Germany um, because one of the cities in your country is called East Greston, um, and there's a Greston in another country. I think that borders you. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, there's also like clearly an America analog called the United Federation, and all the names are very American. <laughs> they couldn't uh, say America. No, well, because they're all trying. To, they're trying to keep it all fictional. Oh, okay. The analogs. Um, this, this is actually a game about an alien world. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of like the idea of having China versus faux China. You know, it's anyway. Um, but what's interesting about it is that all you're doing is people come into your booth. 
Um, you ask them for their papers. You say, papers, please, hence the title. Uh, they hand you their passport and or an ID supplement or a work pass, all this different stuff. As you go through the game and as you start learning how to do things, they keep throwing more stuff at you. Um, you have more stuff you have to check. They change the rules constantly. Um, so basically, it's a game about bureaucracy. But what I find brilliant about it is that you have very interesting narrative choices you get to make just by deciding whether you hit approve or deny on a uh, on their passport. Um, you can sometimes choose to break the rules in order to, uh, like say for instance, someone needs to get in but they don't have the right paperwork or there's an error. You can let them in because you're taking you know pity on them for a situation they have. Or someone's being a jerk to you in line and all their papers are good, but you had, no, you're not getting in. Um, so my most recent playthrough, I was playing it very much by the book. I just want to see basically how long can I survive. So, um, would this be the, um, Estroskin book or the United the, Federation's book? The Estroskin book. Oh, the, okay. the, the, the papers that were, uh, waiting on my desk or the, the bulletin that was waiting on my, uh, in my workstation every morning when I arrived, uh, telling me, uh, inspector, here are your instructions for the day. I followed those instructions. Well, well done comrade. <laughs> Yeah, or da. <laughs> uh, although if it's supposed to be German, I guess it would be uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. So I, I did this very sort of neutral playthrough, just basically following the rules. I did bend them very occasionally, but I didn't do anything crazy. Uh, there are opportunities here and there to, for instance, aid the um, resistance. Um, they'll sometimes want to let assassins in through the border and that sort of thing, or they'll tell you to stop this person from getting through. Um, there are cases where... Um, you know, just regular people coming through have their own personal problems and they need your help or you can um, sort of fight back against them a little bit. But one of the fascinating things about it is I've seen, I, I've heard people um, or I've heard of people playing through multiple times with different uh, D&D style alignments, you know, things like neutral, uh, you know, good and evil or <laughs> lawful or chaotic. You can play papers, please, as a chaotic neutral. You could, I suppose. <laughs> Um, the idea there being that, um, for example, you choose to follow the rules, um, and when you do follow the rules, are you, uh, in your own mind, more evil or more good? And so you have these, like, very oh, interesting sort of, like, moral quandaries just by looking at people's papers and hitting stamps. And the very interesting narrative unfolds. You see uh, newspaper headlines each morning that are talking about current events. Um, you hear things from you know, like other guards at your post. You hear it from uh, people coming through the line. Um, your superiors occasionally come to visit and give you an update on things, that sort of stuff. Um, you can choose, for instance, to uh, aid the resistance. Uh, near the end of the game, there's a possibility you can try to escape into a neighboring country. Um, rather than stick around for an audit that's coming up. Oh, I didn't know about that. Um, you also get paid. Uh, there's a salary you basically get paid. Um, I think it's 10 credits uh, for each person you process before the day ends. And I think actually if you have someone in the booth and the day ends, um, uh, you don't get credit for them. Um, so you're incentivized to get the people through quickly uh, because you actually have to manage your budget. You have to pay rent, and you also have to pay for um, food and heat optionally. Um, if people in your family get sick, you have to pay for medicine. Um, mm. And so you'll actually see a status each evening, like uh, people are okay or someone's hungry or someone is cold because you haven't been able to afford heat. Um, someone is sick or very sick, and if they're very sick and you don't buy the medicine, they'll die. Um, so my mother-in-law was the first and only one to go. Uh, <laughs> well. Um, yeah, no, no, no comment. Which was purely, it was purely like I had basically the choice between with the money I had on that evening. Um, two people are very sick. You can only afford medicine for one. Who's it going to be? I just had to make the choice. Um, so some very interesting decisions coming through on this. Um, and, you know, therefore a lot of interesting political commentary about bureaucracy and laws and, you know, doing the right thing or just doing what you're told. Um, what is the right thing in some cases? Um, so really, really fascinating. You said it already. It's doing what you're told. Yeah. <laughs> For uh, Glory to Ostroska. So uh, there's a, uh, a little shout out here to uh, Adam Koble, one of the designers of um, the Dungeon World RPG, which I rather enjoy reading. Um, it is a good one. He did a Let's Play uh, where he played as a character from one of his earlier campaigns uh, who has a Russian accent. Um, he was playing as that character in Papers, Please. Uh, and so he was doing the entire playthrough with a Russian accent. It was oh, wow. quite hilarious. And like, you know, all the, all the people, like they, they speak, it's all text-based. Um, I mean, there's graphics, but there's no voices. And the voices you hear are just kind of like the simulac. Yeah. Um, 
and they all have like this very sort of broken English implying that they've got like this different accent or something. So, uh, but that was quite uh, funny. So I definitely recommend checking out um, Adam Koble's playthrough of the game. Uh, if nobody else is, uh, if you're interested in playing the game and haven't had a chance to play it yourself, but highly recommended. Yeah. It sounds like fun. Well, I've been playing one called grow home. Um, some of the listeners may be familiar with this one. If they have a PlayStation plus account, uh, keeping up with Doc's gaming is easy to do. All you have to do is download the PlayStation Plus free games of the month because <laughs> <That's all laughs> I'm, <you> <laughs> I'm poor and this is what I play. Um, but uh, this was a really neat one. I, I especially liked this one because you are a robot. A uh, robot named Bud. That is a biotanical um, something something unit. I don't know. But anyway, um, you, you drop from space out of a spaceship that is called mom Mm. and you have to find the space seed and the space seed is this giant plant that you have to grow and in order to get back up to your spaceship you have to grow home that's Ah. the title but you get i'm going to call them islands but they're kind of like floating islands um honestly it reminded me a lot of the uh, lady blackbird world um, from RPG fame, mm, yeah. um, but it, it was it, it, it was kind of a post-apocalyptic backstory of what happened here, mm. or maybe it was just um, a weird alien world. I don't know. It's it's really hard to tell, but it's got this kind of panspermia thing going, okay. where these these seeds um, are apparently all around the galaxy, and 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 Mom the spaceship is trying to find them and collect them, and if you can grow the plant all the way up, then then you're there. Well, it sounds really simple, but one of the, I guess, joys of playing it is that Bud is powered down. He's very low. His rocket um, pack, is, uh, his, his backpack doesn't work very well. Uh, and so you've got to give him power-ups. And you do this by collecting crystals. And there's 100, uh, technically 101 crystals. And in order to get 100%, you have to get 100 crystals. And power yourself up as you go. And, and I'm like four short. And I, I don't really 100% games. I don't do this. But it's been bugging me because it's been a busy week. And so I, since last weekend when I played, I haven't been able to get back on and look for those four crystals. And and that's how kind of insidious this game was. It really captured me and made me want to just 100% complete it. Uh, there's this really great moment where you think you're done with the game and it gives you kind of a second quest, which is fantastic. And the whole time you're going, you're climbing around on these sort of jack-in-the-beanstalk style vines and if you fall off you fall for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters and uh, hopefully not into the ocean actually you want to try to aim for land and break if you can with Mm. your with your rocket pack um or maybe a a flower that'll help you coast down like a parachute or Mm. a leaf if you're really lucky that's kind of like a glider and there's all these really great mechanics that, that come along with it um so yeah check out grow home uh, it's available on Steam. It's available on uh, PS4, and uh, I really enjoyed it. It's not a long game by any means, mm-hmm. which is also a, a plus for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, it was a lot of fun. The controls, unlike anything I'd seen before, uh, you actually control the right hand and the left hand independently. And you're kind of crawling around mm-hmm. uh, doing that. So it kind of took an afternoon to get used to uh that very unique scheme, but I think that's part of the appeal. Yeah, it's a uh, kind of quap like maybe not quite so infuriating. Infuriating. Yeah, um, actually, it's it's meant to help with the experience, not uh, be a challenge to overcome. I'm, right. It's not Octodad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By any means, it's uh, it's more something to create a particular feel in the yeah. character, and maybe because like uh, my impression seeing the trailer was that like this is meant to be like this whole basically like baby robot and so yeah, you're kind really, of st- yeah. stumbling your way through this unfamiliar world and so you're kind of growing up with the robot so to speak mm-hmm. and, and it's cute um it's got very simple graphics it kind of reminded me of minecraft in a way but uh not not 16 bit i mean it's it's well done cell shading but um it's i don't know it's it's indescribable mm. um check out some gameplay footage for grow home now it's time for table talk Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. I found something this week uh, that really intrigued me, and we've known it's coming for a long time. Uh, what with 3D printing being on the rise and 
on the cheap. Mm -hmm. You can now get a 3D printer at home for just a couple hundred bucks. It's it's really pretty amazing. Um, but there's a website that is completely capitalizing on this cheap 3D printing in a good way, and it's called HeroForge.com. And as soon as you get in there, you're going to see um, you can build a character. So there's thousands, I don't know, maybe maybe millions of permutations of what you can do, and it does it really well by classifying in genre. Mm. And this is the thing I especially liked about their take. Um, somebody has done some really great 3D models, and uh, 3D modeled the guns, the hats, the clothes, the boots. Um, you can go in and you can customize the characters' looks, the faces, the expressions, the emotions, all of that stuff nice. dynamically, um, just like you would with any RPG, uh, CRPG that you're creating. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you move that over into your um, into your cart and pay fifteen bucks, and they will print it and send it to you. Nice. And you still have to paint it, um, or or you don't. Mm -hmm. But I can see the applications for this because it's so cross genre. Um, they have modern, they have sci-fi, they have fantasy, they have uh, they have Asian. <laughs> um, that you could use this in uh, you could well, you could use it in role play. You could use it in board games. You, mm. I mean, it's it's, it's limitless. Any, anything that has minis, you could you could use it for. And I imagine these are uh, like standard one inch base minis. Oh, or? I'm really glad you asked that. Actually, you can do uh, circular bases, you can do square bases, but uh, there's actually three scales. Mm. So you can do um, you can do a full-on six-inch pewter mini if you want. Wow. I mean, the thing the thing costs a hundred bucks, but yeah. uh, if you want it, you can you can print it. So there's tons of nice. options. Nice. Uh, full-on metals. Um, basically, they they're, they're pretty much statues at that point. Mm -hmm. um, there's even a bronze option. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I think that um, for fifteen bucks, a nice high-quality plastic mm -hmm. in a standard you know, one-inch base scale. Um, and customized. Customized to the way that you want it. Yeah. That's totally worth it for a, for a campaign. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I would do that. Um, in fact, I plan to. And that's interesting to me, too, because I remember um, something that came up in a class I took at UTD a while back was the the way that the the game, the, the tabletop game market is kind of shifting for the types of games that, like, you know, I don't play very often, but, you know, for war gamers and that sort of sure, thing. Sure, yeah. People who like to have the games where they collect all the minis and they paint them and they model them and they play games with, like, these hundreds and hundreds of minis. The way that those companies make their money, naturally, is by selling those models to people. Right. Um, and so there have been con some, some concerns now that with 3D printing, people are just going to be able to print their own minis and the company's not going to be able to sell them. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, this is something that, just with some smart adaption of their their approach, the game industry can handle pretty easily. Oh yeah. Um, basically, just have a website, an official website, where um, you even like have different things that are tailored for. If you have this sort of printer, you know, get this model or whatever. And basically, you have the customer pay digitally for the rights to the model file. And then you just send the model file and they can print it out. And so in that way, you know, you have some people are going to be able to do homebrewed, like do their own models and print it, and they won't need anyone else. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the average gamer is not going to have the 3D modeling skills. <laughs> or the nor, time. Or, or the time. Or even if they have the skills, like not in the same way that a professional figure designer yeah. is going to have. Yeah. Um, so I think there will be um, a hunger for like really well done professional models from known names. Yeah. Not just like from random websites where it's like, Oh yeah, this guy's pretty good. I'll get his mm -hmm. stuff. You know, it's like, this is coming from, you know, games workshop yeah. or this is coming from fantasy flight and yeah. you, you download their file, you print it out and then, you know, they get paid for the rights to the model. Uh, maybe you can even discount it because you now, you no longer have to pay for the manufacturing costs, the shipping cost. All that sort of stuff. You basically just get to print money. Oh, that's a really good point. I wonder how long it'll take Citadel to get behind this. Don't know. So, <laughs> we'll find Interesting. out. Interesting. <laughs> but yeah, HeroForge.com. Go check it out. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So speaking of kind of a, a shift in the industry and, you know, new technologies, 3D technology specifically, um, kind of changing the way we're going to be gaming here in the near future, I believe, Doc, you have learned recently about a new technology with um, augmented reality. Yeah. Um, well, anybody who was paying attention at E3 this year, um, back in July, or I guess June, uh, may already know about this, but um, I'm, I'm a big Minecraft fan, and, and I didn't know about it, so... Uh, it, it really came from an article that I spotted that was done in CNET magazine. 
and I, I don't really know how widely um, you know, talked about or known this was, but basically Microsoft's on-stage demo of a new piece of technology called the HoloLens, which is similar to the Oculus, um, or Oculus Rift, if, if you will. Um, at E3 this year, it was, um, according to this article, tremendously impressive. And there's an embedded video, which I watched. On, I was impressed, too. Basically, what they did was they took Minecraft and they projected it using AR, that's augmented reality, onto a table. Now, okay, so what? Well, the thing of it was that you're talking about a mod. Um, sorry. The, the thing is that you're talking about um, someone who is an operator, someone who has full op uh, privileges and is able to give the commands and make lightning strike and that kind of a thing. Not actually in the world, but over the world. Mm. And so you actually have players that are in the world then playing. So I'm imagining someone using this while their server is up and they've got maybe a competition going. Mm -hmm. It would really change the way Let's Plays work. Oh, yeah. I mean, fantastic ability to uh, do a PvP server or uh, some of those Hunger Game type mm -hmm. uh, things that happen in Minecraft oh, yeah, all be, the time. That'd be awesome. Just even a Spleef game would be different if you could have this overview and looking at it in 3D on your table in augmented reality. You'd be able to just get voice commands to make things happen, like... Uh you know, potentially like spawn a creeper here or yeah. that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, because it's actually tracking your eye movements and what you're looking at and focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I assume there's some kind of like reticule. I, I, I don't know. That really wasn't shown. Um, but the wherever it is you're looking, that's the block that it's going to target. So there's so much potential with this because the computing power and um, I would even say the software has caught up with augmented reality. I mean, our phones can do augmented reality. All you have to say is, where's the closest McDonald's? And, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to overlay it and mm -hmm. point in the right direction for you. Um, but that said, I think this is really important for a different reason, too, other than just the cool factor. People have been focusing for a while now on virtual reality. Right. And there's some problems with virtual reality. I mm -hmm. mean, um, you know, we, we know a couple of professors who've been really working on this, doing great um, work with it. Uh, grant work, that kind of a thing. And where the money is right now with VR is how do we get 40% of the population not to become seasick the instant they try this thing on? Right. Um, and the truth is, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. This is not a problem with AR. Augmented reality is still keeping you in the context of the real world. Yeah. So instead of changing where you are, it's overlaying on top of it. I think it's probably the appropriate month and year to speak about it in terms of uh, Back to the Future 2. <laughs> Remember everybody wearing the goggles there? Yeah. I think we're actually getting there because that was that was augmented reality. Granted, it was a phone call, <laughs> and they're still using fax machines. I don't know why, but um, <laughs> fax machines are the future, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, Marty changed it at the end, so it's okay. And mm -hmm. the changes are just uh, just ripples in time. Um, <laughs> but without getting too far off of topic, um, the article on and CNET says. Um, for now, those could be HoloLens' ways of showing off why it and VR is worth paying attention to. After all, you can only keep one headset on your face at a time. Um, and that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. So I I'm going to be looking a lot more at AR. I had kind of dismissed it for a while, but um, given that it has huge potential for uh, some of the games that we love, I mean, just, just think about maybe a MOBA. Mm -hmm. or And I'm not a MOBA fan, but yeah. I could be if I was looking at it with, with AR. Mm -hmm. Um, or even just an RTS. Yeah, man. I mean, there have been some interesting, um, you know, strategy games and other games like that that have come out on phones um, using AR. You know, yeah. the, the phone camera pointing at like a little card you place on the table. Yeah, that gives exactly. You the, the center point. Um, th there's there's something about adding that physicality um, that's like almost in a way. Um, an animated board game, in a sense, mm -hmm. um, which I think even like adding like the, a new dimension to tabletop gaming might be a really interesting. Oh yeah, for this. that's a good point. Um, Man, if 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 you could actually play something like Warhammer um, by using augmented reality in, in a virtual space and watching the fights mm -hmm. animated like a video game, man, that even that get me to actually play Age of Sigmar, <laughs> Age of Six and up. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think I think that the AR definitely does have an, a different sort of appeal than VR does, mm -hmm. in the sense that it's just sort of adding to a familiar territory. And in fact, um, there are even some really interesting little 
more tech demos than anything, but like little AR games on the 3DS that take advantage of you know putting down a card and having you know two cameras so it is able to recognize depth and angle and stuff like that. Um, this flat card with like these little um, tracker markers effectively that tell you um, how far away from the camera it is, what the angle is, and that sort of thing. So you can see these 3D objects in the real world, which is something that um, you know for all the things that 3D TVs and even the 3DS itself can do with you know looking at something and seeing it pop out. Yeah, there's something that throws you off the instant you try to move your head to the left, mm-hmm. and it looks the same. You know, with AR, you can now walk around something. And it stays in place. That's right. Um, and that's something I think is really cool that even VR can't quite do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's dynamic and in real time. I mean, this is going to revolutionize the way that um, films are done and, and things like motion capture are done in real time. Mm-hmm. So another little bit of uh, gaming news that I wanted to bring up. I got an email today from hum- Humble Bundle, um, which, of course, is infamous for filling up my Steam library with way more games than I'll ever play. Um, <laughs> Start playing now. <laughs> um, but no, it's a really awesome website where, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, um, they have periodically a bundle of games that you can pay basically what you want for. Um, and they sometimes have tiers where like, you know, pay more than the average to unlock these three games on top of the base six, um, pay more than 10 or 12 or however many dollars to unlock, uh, this really like premium game, that sort of thing. But then you can actually designate, um, here's what I want to do, or here's what I want to pay for my bundle. And here is the, um, distribution of where I want that money to go. So you can have it go a hundred percent to charity. If you want, you can have it, um, be split between charity and the developers of the games who are in the bundle and, um, uh, the humble tip, which basically helps keep the website running. Um, but they are recently coming out with a new service called Humble Monthly, which is a $12 subscription thing, which I think is kind of jumping on this new bandwagon of like, you know, Loot Crate and stuff like that, yeah. where you pay, you know, a monthly fee and you get curated stuff sent to you. Um, this is going to be highly curated games, as they put it. Um, 5% is still going to go to charity, which is an interesting number because before, when you do the bundle, nobody involved can really control where the um where the buyers are going to put their money right they could put all of their money to the developers they could put it all to charity um so theoretically if everyone does 100 percent to charity the developers get nothing and while they get some you know publicity and it's great and they get more copies out um they don't make any any money off of it having a fixed rate and humble bundle being able to negotiate with these people um, I think is going to unlock, so to speak, a lot of new games on Humble Bundle that you wouldn't get before. And so you can get really good deals on probably pretty premium games oh. uh, for $12 a month. Now, that being said, you know I don't think it's something that I'm going to sign up for. One, because I just don't have $12 a month to spend like that, mm-hmm. um, especially on games that like I don't necessarily know ahead of time like what I'm going to be getting. It could be that I get like one game that I'm cool with every three months and the rest of them I don't really care about. Uh, whereas currently with Humble Bundle, um, I see when a new bum- bundle comes out, and I'm like, oh, cool, this, this one's got like three games that I like in it. I'll buy this one, and then I'll sort of skip the next five or whatever. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so I think it's a service that will appeal to people, and I'm interested to see what sort of games now they're going to be able to get on there with um, being able to more tightly control. Um, like, we can promise you, um, developer who's interested, that you will get this much per unit you know, that we, that we sell to our mm-hmm. subscribers. And they can also tell them we have this many subscribers. So this many people will be paying us $12 to get whatever you put in there. See, that reminds me a lot of the, the PlayStation Plus thing, mm-hmm. actually. Um, I mean, there are other perks that come along with that besides just the free games. But I, you, you kind of have to look at it mathematically. Uh, it's a bit like a gym membership, you know. It's, do I want to pay $5 for going once a week or mm-hmm. do I want to pay $60 for the uh, the semester? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? Well, hmm, that would require me to go twice a week and I'm not feeling that athletic. So. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, yeah, because, I mean, do, do I play $12 worth of games mm-hmm. a month on Steam? My answer is no, yeah. because I'm more of a console gamer right now, mm-hmm. um, with maybe the exception of Minecraft. But um, oof, yeah, that that's a, that's a cool deal though, because mm-hmm. I, I know there's some people out there. Oh, it's not on Steam. I'm not going to do mm-hmm. uh, that, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there the, most of the humble bundle games can be redeemed on Steam, so. Yeah, there's that. So. Yeah, but yeah, I'm very interested to see where this goes, um, and I'm curious to see too moving forward what their model is going to be as far as uh, maybe announcing a month ahead, like here's what's going to be in the next month. Ooh, that's cool. Um, or will it be more like it is now this month? Here's what we're sending you. Yeah. So 
But uh, very intriguing news. Indeed. And now, the official One Tweet RPG of the week. All right, so this week's official One Tweet RPG is as follows. Um, PCs get an odd trinity, uh, for example, uh, the trinity of celery, onion, and carrot, um, a side that is often called a uh, mirepoix, I believe is how you pronounce that. Um, it's used in French cuisine. Uh, these become their three core stats. Uh, you split five points among them, roll d6 less than or equal to whichever stat fits, and fits theirs in quotation marks. Uh, so the idea here is it's kind of a goofy um, take on a simple RPG. Um, you come up with something, any set of three that kind of is iconic, you know, uh, celery, onion, carrot came to mind because we happened to be watching uh, Good Eats when I, uh, when I got this idea uh, on the Food Network. Um, and you take five points and basically I say, you know, I'm going to put uh, one point into this stat and two into the other two or something like that. Um, or you can just like ignore one stat and pour five into, or ignore a couple of them and pour five into it. And then whatever that number is, you're trying to meet or go lower than with your D6 to succeed at the roll. Um, so you've actually got fairly low chances if you're doing a balanced sort of setup. Um, and you can decide in your own game if you want to allow people to level up somehow. Um, I basically said five points so nobody would put six into something and not be able to lose. Oh, that makes sense. But, you know, where this starts getting fun is interpreting whether those stats uh, are, first of all, something that all the PCs have, or if each PC has their own set of three, which you can kind of do some interesting thematic things there. Mm-hmm. Um, or, uh, like, for example, you could have the stats red, white, and blue. Uh, whatever that means. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and so... Um, Soldier character. Maybe. Pol- politician, maybe. Yeah. Or French. Oh. Well. Uh, <laughs> to go along with him, you're Ah, they, they just stole her. <laughs> um, All right, well, in that case... I'm well, gonna... we, we stole it from the British, though, so I mean... Oh, well, that's also true. <laughs> well, I'm going to go with onion, celery, and bell pepper, which is the Cajun trinity. There you go. Uh, yeah. Slight the, modification. The, the Cajun holy trinity. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, so that um, not only do I have to speak with a, with a, a Cajun accent, mm-hmm. but... Uh, I will win all rules, I guarantee. <laughs> um, it was a long way to go for that joke, but hey, you know, whatever. Yeah, you just had to get it in there, so I, I, I respect that. But then uh, deciding, do those stats determine what you're able to do, or do you um, just say you're allowed to do whatever, but you have to associate a particular skill or action with one of those stats? So, for example, um, if you need to sneak somewhere, is sneaking more a celery thing or a carrot thing? Um, and you can sort of have some fun trying to uh, justify to the GM why you think that sneaking <laughs> is actually carrot because carrots improve your night vision. And uh, in the dark, if I've been eating my carrots, I'll be able to see better or something like that. I don't know. Celery is pretty bland. People tend not to notice it. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, just fun stuff like that. Or it's something like, uh, OK, so we're not assuming it's whatever you want and it, like sort of associate a stat with it. It is um, my powers, so to speak, are celery, onion and carrot. What does right. that mean? So. Well, well, onion is clearly to do with emotions. Yes, it's the it's the one that makes you cry. You've got many layers to you. Yeah, as, yeah. Oh. As, as like a, an ogre. Wait, no. yeah. <laughs> onions are a lot like ogres. They have many layers. A little, little Shrek reference for yeah. you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the one tweet RPG of the week. I think it's one that would be fun to mess around with. In fact, I'm thinking about maybe having us run and unplugged with it at some point. Oh yeah, uh, just for uh, just for the lulls. So. There you are. This is Roleplay for Roleplay, the mechanics of tabletop roleplaying games. All right, Chris, it seems appropriate that uh, since it's just the two of us that we do a shameless plug. Shameless plug! After all, I am Doc of Doc and Kruger, and you are, in fact, Kruger of Doc and Kruger, so here we are. This, this is correct. Yes, and we have published our first, our very, very first official on the web you can pay money and feed my child and cat uh where was i going with this oh yeah the uh, the simple rpg give us money now <laughs> the simple rpg this is actually one that um is called docs simple rpg although i have to admit you uh were instrumental in refining it mm-hmm. so uh props for that thank you uh Especially with the with the very nice layout, mm. and it's well, it looks nicer than it ever has. Mm. Uh, but we're excited about this. It's it's actually up on um, drive through RPG drive through RPG dot com, mm-hmm. right? And you can search for Doc's Simple RPG, and it is actually kind of similar. 
uh, and and probably uh, either derivative of or derived to I'm not sure which mm. uh, our one tweet this week, nice. which is oh no, there was this this ten year old game was definitely inspired by the one tweet, this right? Week. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, but but it's it's also a trinity. But in this one, it's the classic mind, body, and soul, mm-hmm. and then you have secondary abilities that uh, come out of that, which you know, you basically take ten points, you you add up the the different areas, and it's a triple Venn diagram. It's su- super simple. Um, but I I developed this many years ago whenever I was teaching uh, kids. I at one point owned a school and all these other things. I've, I've been a, an educator on all levels, basically six through, well, do the math, it's like 18th or 19th grade, right? <laughs> whenever we're talking about college kids. We, we, we graduate students tend not to um, want to think about it that way, <laughs> because then we realize just how long we've been in school. Yeah, and you start adding up your student loans, speaking up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it comes down to, um, I wanted to teach the fundamentals of a storytelling game very, very quickly with a character sheet that could be made very quickly. Basically, it's a one-shot system. Um, So it's setting agnostic. It is uh, very, very versatile because all character creation concepts, if you will, uh, character sheets, are going to have elements from these three areas. So we just boiled it straight down to the three areas themselves, mind, body, and soul. So, As some other systems have done before, but well, with, yeah. with more complexity than we... Yeah, and, and my goal was to get it as simple as possible. So you always roll 1d6, and if you roll... Or un- 2d6. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, you always roll <laughs> 2d6, and uh, if, if it's under... Let just start that again. So you always roll 2d6, and if it's under your stat, you succeed. Um it, you use the core stats for stuff you want to try to do, and you use the derived stats for stuff you want to try to prevent. That's really all there is to it. Uh, now, for fun, we included a few scenarios that I wrote over the years as well. Uh, there's an alien scenario, and there's uh, also a, a kind of a pharaoh, mummy, undead scenario um, geared towards kids, as one would expect. But at the same time, uh, I think any group that enjoys having fun, comedy, silly, slapstick kind of uh, one-shots would enjoy it. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the system is, once you've played it once, you will never forget it because it is so elegantly simple. You can pull up 2D6 on your phone for any, you know, your favorite app. Um, I'm a fan of the Star Wars app, personally. Yeah, for a good one. <laughs> that dice app. But because it sort of simulates physical dice, so it's not just an algorithm. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. technically, it, since it's programmed, there's, you know... What mm-hmm. would, but because you're actually, like, rolling a model of a die... Exactly. Uh, there's that physicality that you get from real dice that makes it feel more random than yeah. string of numbers. Uh, so, you know, go download that one. And then after paying for that, consider the fact that you can actually pay less... For the system, then for the dice app. See what I did there? Yeah, yeah <laughs> there okay. you go. And um, um, we are selling it on pay what you want model. Um, we have a recommended price of zero um, dollars, basically because you know it's something that we were able to put together pretty quickly. We already had it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, effort did go into the design, but it's a very simple system. Absolutely, and it's only four pages, including like a little forward from Doc on one page. the The system itself is actually all contained on one page. Yeah, that um, was which the goal. is also the character sheet. Um, so the extra three pages are just supplemental stuff. So this is our um, first entry into oddball RPGs. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, pay what you want model. Um, if you feel like tipping us a buck or five bucks or a hundred bucks, whatever you feel like, you can do that. Otherwise, you can get it for free and just enjoy. So tips a dollar for every time you play it. How about that? That's going to get expensive fairly quick, depending. I know. That's the idea. <laughs> the pay per play model. Um, yeah, the pay per play model. <laughs> Paper play. There Paper you go. play. Yeah. <laughs> On a tabletop Oh, I'm glad Hearthstone doesn't do that. Yeah. That would be terrible. Yeah. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. So at the time of recording, um, pretty much this week, I think yesterday actually was the first sort of public event. They were doing a uh, thing on um, Entertainment Weekly. I think they're doing a live stream uh, where they had some of the cast members, cast and crew, um, watching it on a live stream. Uh, They played the first, I think, three episodes of the series. Uh, Con Man which is um, produced, directed, produced, written, um, I forget exactly which, basically created by uh, Alan Tudyk, who um, you nerds out there might know as uh, Wash from Firefly. Great. Um, Because only nerds would know that. Only nerds would know that, yes. Thanks, man. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Which is probably why it was canceled. No. Oh! oh. (laughs) No, I mean, it it was an excellent show. We we all love it. Um, But basically what Con Man is, is... um, loosely based on the experience that Alan had 
um, going to science fiction conventions after being on the show Firefly. Uh, so in this series, um, they are uh, they were on the show called Spectrum, which is a sci-fi show with the ship, and he was the pilot just like he was on Firefly. Um, and the premise here is basically that he is an actor who has been going to these conventions ever since then, um, doesn't really... Um, feel quite at home with the the types who go to sci-fi fan conventions um you know he he considers himself more of a an artiste sort of actor and uh his his uh co-star on the show uh who's played by nathan fillion who was the uh who is captain mal on firefly uh, also the captain in spectrum uh has gone on to uh, great fame and he's been starring in movies and on tv shows ongoing uh and so he's the big star and you know he's uh, meanwhile, um, Alan's character has kind of been uh, relegated to just going to conventions all the time. And so it's a comedy. It was crowdfunded on Indiegogo. They actually um, got fans to fund them. I forget how much, but it was definitely over a million dollars to produce this yeah, was a lot. 12, 13 episode series. And they also got enough to produce uh, the so-called lost episode of Spectrum. So basically they made <laughs> a show within a show, based on a show. It's interesting. That's way too much algebra for me. Uh, but we uh, we actually sat down. We uh, we basically, you can rent it now. Uh, $15 gets you the whole season as it comes out. Currently, the first four episodes are out, and uh, they will be adding new episodes weekly through October. Um, and when you... Excuse me. When you rent it on Vimeo for fifteen dollars, you get a three month viewing period, so you can watch as many times within those three months as you want. Oh, that's kind of cool. Um, Blockbuster ten, never had that. Mm-hmm. Appro- approximately ten minute episodes, um, but again, I think it's a good thing that they release the first three or four all at once because then you can sort of watch it as if it's just one longer uh, episode of a TV show. Um, so, kind of this online streaming web series. Doc, what do you think of it? You know, I, I liked it. Um, I could kind of tell that the production quality was uh, a little bit lower than some of the other shows. I mean, it was right up there with, like, the Guild, that kind of a thing. And it didn't suffer for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it, it didn't quite get to the point of, oh, Dr. Horrible sing-along blog, for example. There were no special effects or anything mm-hmm. like that, nor really did there need to be. Mm-hmm. Um because it's a show literally about just going to science fiction conventions. Yeah, so. yeah. I could tell that there was a limited number of writers. The humor was very channeled. Fortunately, I liked those writers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it was clever. But, I mean, there was the obligatory, uh, you know, um, bodily function joke and yeah. the, the obligatory uh, uh, get drunk and uh, have a hangover type moment. Mm-hmm. The, the being embarrassed by uh, a crowd of people who are uh, clearly just not right, you know, mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, but I enjoyed it. Um, the the episodes that we watched, um, I, you know, I, I genuinely wanted to continue to watch them. So mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't mind watching them again, actually, when the rest of them are out. I think it's... Um, there was a comment that you made while we were watching it that I thought was kind of interesting, is that, that they, they lead up mm-hmm. to these sort of trigger point humors. Mm-hmm. I forget exactly how you said it. What, what I said was they they have recurring elements yes. that keep getting mentioned so that there's a payoff later. A payoff later, um, yeah. So, for example, the bourbon balls. The um, bourbon balls, Are, are shown yeah. early on. They're mentioned as a thing that causes indigestion, um, hence the, the potty humor right, that yeah. ends up happening. Um, but at one point, a fan gives the protagonist some bourbon balls, um, which is taken away from him. Uh, by his assistant who uh, had indigestion from them. Right. Um, and uh, later on, uh, they keep mentioning bourbon balls over and over again. And eventually he, um, in perhaps a bit of a, a vengeful sort of fit, gives them to uh, Sean Astin. Uh, who, <laughs> as himself. Uh, who uh, unwittingly, yeah, he, as I think, quote unquote himself. Yeah, it's a persona. Uh, but but um, yeah, he, he eats them. And then the, uh, the next shot is of him. Um, suffering on the toilet. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the, uh, the the signature phrase, apparently, from Spectrum, uh, for, especially for uh, the character Cash, not not at all uh, referencing Wash. No, not at all. Um, no. Is, uh, I'll see you in hell! <laughs> uh, and so he's saying uh, to Alan's character, I'll see you in hell, after giving him the bourbon balls. Exactly. So, uh, so and there, there are a lot of little elements like that. Like, they keep, like, popping up, and then there's a little bit of a payoff there. So... Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a nice witty little show. I think the episode length and the pacing is just about right. I agree. Um, it gets the point across without like you know sort of beating you over the head with it. Yeah, so. if it was a twenty minute sitcom model, I I just wouldn't 
I don't think it would be quite as enjoyable. Mm. Some uh, some neat uh, nerdy cameos, for instance, uh, Will Wheaton shows up at one point. Yeah, he does. Um, they also have apparently uh, real fans, um, basically being the extras of the That's convention. That's cool. Um, you know, people not just like hired extras off the street, but like actual fans who, who they didn't have to pay. Wait a minute. Well, I don't, I don't know if they paid them or not. Maybe they did, or maybe <laughs> they. May, I don't. I'd have to check this, but maybe they were even uh, backers at a level at which they oh, were invited on the set to be a part of it. About so, that, yeah. uh, oh, speaking of the backers, another little fun thing about it. Uh, the the massive list of backers. What they do is instead of listing it in the credits, just as like a really long credit scroll, um, they have it go by really quickly as tiny tiny text just waterfalling across the background of mm-hmm. the credits while the normal credits are going on top of but it. But you know, I paused it, and in high definition, you can read the names. Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah. So, uh, it was a, I think it was a really clever way to do that, and it just demonstrates too, uh, just like the speed and the mass of names going by it tells you just how many people are involved in making Tons. this. Um, so crowdfunding is a interesting new beast in the world oh, of entertainment. Isn't it though? Wow. And so, uh, but yeah, go check out Con Man. Uh, pretty cool little show. Yeah. Uh, four episodes in, it's pretty entertaining. And uh, if you're into geekdom, uh, you'll probably appreciate it. Yeah. Go for Alan Tudyk. Stay for Felicia Day. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. Yeah, you know, I wasn't really sure whether to put this into a table talk or, or a Mobile Minute, because this is a game that started out, for me especially, as just this classic, old, tabletop game that I love. This is a game I've played so many times with my wife and with groups and game nights that Oh man, I just don't even know how to describe the the personal love for it, that I have for it. The game is called Carcassonne, and this is named for a French castle that I've actually been to. I was there in '98, um, and interestingly, it's the only castle in the entire world that actually has cone-shaped pinnacles. Huh. And the reason for them is because of the uh, '90s film with Kevin Costner. Uh, Robin Hood, Mm. Prince of Thieves, uh, because the filmmakers decided that it didn't look right without the the little cone. So (laughs) it's kind of silly in that sense, but you know, the the art in the game matches it and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, So you lay down tiles, it's a tile-based game, and you build castles, you, you build roads, and you're connecting up basically farmland. And as you do this, you're laying down your meeples, um, which is really kind of the original meeple game. Mm. And scoring as you go whenever you score features. And the more expansions you have, the bigger your, your set. You can actually combine two core sets together. I mean, you can just you can go crazy with this. I've seen at conventions where the whole weekend was taken up with playing the game. And it, it's like, uh, you know, 10 meter by 10 meter playing <laughs> field. It's insane. Just sprawling countryside, yeah. Yeah, it's totally insane. Um, well, a long time ago, or a while back, I guess, about five years ago... Um, it was one of the first that was converted over into um, the mobile space. Mm-hmm. And so Carcassonne, the mobile game, was an extremely faithful translation. I bought it when it first came out. And um, since then, have bought just about every expansion that's come out with it. And so you've got some of the classic expansions that you can buy in the board game. Um, like, for example, a double base tile set, like I was just saying. Uh, the River Expansion, Inns and Cathedrals, Traders and Builders. These are all just really great uh, additions that change the rules just slightly enough to make it interesting without breaking it. Because a, a lot of board games, you get so many of these things, they become mutually exclusive. and nah, 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 nah. Well, I own all of the expansions IRL and digitally, so that's got to say something. Well, recently, they came out with the Winter Edition. And it's the one edition that I didn't pick up uh, for the board game, mostly because it's winter tiles and so it's white. But if you play it with the others, it doesn't look right. Mm. It just there's this hard edge of white against green, sure, yeah. and it just doesn't look right. Well, the amazing thing about the digital space is this: for a couple of bucks, if you pick up the winter version, it will allow you the option of changing all of your tiles. Nice. And all expansions. Hmm. This is brilliant. So now there's something that's offered in the mobile space that isn't offered in the other. Hmm. Coincidentally, for a while, it wasn't that way. Um, but it, it now has become that, which is very recently has become that, and they adjusted those tiles with just an announcement. So if you've purchased that, they basically just gave it to you for free, which nice. was really cool. Very nice. Um, 
There's a kind of a fantasy expansion called Princess and Dragon, which changes the tone from historical over to uh, dragons going around and eating your meeples and that kind of a thing. But you don't have to pick and choose anymore. And this is the coolest thing of all. For about 10 bucks now, you can pick up, along with the game, the anniversary bundle, the fifth anniversary bundle. You get all the expansions. That's like seven expansions. And... Um, Play it on your, I, on your iOS device, and it, it's there. And then I, I guarantee you, if you play this game and you love it, you will want to go out and pick up the, uh, the Super Pack, which is about 120 bucks for all the physical expansions in one big box mm. as well. I think that the digital versions of board games are a great way to get introduced to them because they, uh, for new players especially, they overcome the barrier of uh, having to read the rules and grok how it works no kidding. as you play. Um, Since it won't let you play it wrong. Yeah, it won't let you play it wrong. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting sometimes because sometimes you play it wrong just assuming you understood it correctly and then find out that it's actually not that way. Right. Uh, but <laughs> The computer um, player schools you. That's how for, actually I, I first played um, Ticket to Ride was on my oh, really? iPhone. Um, and it speeds the game up a whole bunch. Yeah, uh, one, you don't have to worry about people knocking the table and messing up all your pieces. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to worry about managing all those pieces. Um, you're able to just sort of like plop it down and everything just sort of works automatically, which is always a perk. It's true. Um, a game that I'd actually be interested to try on tablet that I actually own um, as, a, as a physical game is Small World. Um, yeah. Because Small World has a lot of moving pieces and parts. And while it is a fairly simple game, um, it takes a lot longer to play through turns than it would on the mobile version because mm -hmm. everything is automated. Um, so uh, the, the mobile version is a great way um, to you know sort of do a pass and play. You can even stick it on the table and rotate the thing around yeah. um, and let people experience the game in kind of an expedited, expedited way and sometimes a way that's less expensive. Well, it's great for travel, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think back to whenever I was a kid, they had all the travel editions of all the classic games. Oh, yeah. and <laughs> now you just hand the, you pass back the iPad. You yeah. know, and, but um, I actually do have Small World in, in both, um, and it is a fantastic translation. Nice. In fact... I realized I was playing a couple of the races wrong okay. because the core mechanics are very simple in Small mm -hmm. World where it gets tricky is knowing how to use each race correctly. Right. And there were a couple of very, very small rule um, quirks mm -hmm. that by playing it in the digital space, I was able to learn it. So, yeah, I can echo what you just said. That's absolutely right. Very nice. So I think it's time to go ahead and move on to our uh, meaty topic of discussion for the evening, which, as we alluded to at the beginning, is about aging of audiences. Um, and so the kind of the two biggest I, the two biggest examples that came to mind for me um, personally are one anime and two Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh yeah, the two um, things that I actually hate. Yeah, <laughs> hmm. uh, we, we've established that I am a uh, Sonic fanboy, um, partially because of nostalgia, which plays very heavily into this. I like so, your thesis. Go ahead and lay it out for us. All right. So my thought here is that. Um, a lot of people acknowledge looking at something objectively that it is intended for a uh, younger audience. Um, for example, with anime, there's a, a, a genre of anime called shonen, um, which pretty like literally translated to something like for young men or for boys. Um, the opposite being uh, shoujo, which is for young girls. Ah. Um, so there are such things as shonen anime and uh, shoujo anime. There are also anime genres that are intended for older people um so like adult men adult women have their own genres um now you know those don't always get necessarily anime adaptions sometimes they're just you know manga like the comic books and stuff mm -hmm. like that um but they are intended for more mature audiences um but most of what we see in anime is either shonen or shoujo and very often just shonen things like dragon ball z um, you know, One Piece, Naruto, all these different ones that you yeah. have probably heard of are all shown in anime. <laughs> Half of which were made into video games. Yep, exactly. Um, and so there is an appeal to them, I think. You know, I, I sort of came to know about anime um, when I was in eighth grade. And so I was like right there in the target age range, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I found that the animation was super cool and exciting. And I still think that like, I really respect some of the animation, like for being able to do cool stuff with timing and flow and like sort of dynamic images. That yeah, kind you of can do had. a lot at 18 frames per second. <laughs> yeah, well, you actually can. <laughs> um, but like they have these really cool techniques to add this, um, this like level of excitement to a scene. That's you know? true. Um, I'll give you that. And so, um, 
But, you know, at the same time, a lot of the plots tend to be very simplistic. Um, and a lot of times it is kind of a coming-of-age story. The, a lot of the main characters are teenagers because they're either at the age that the, the audience, the intended audience is, or they're at an age that the audience kind of wants to be. For right? you literary nerds, that is referred to as a Bildungsroman or Bildungsroman A if it is a girl. There you go. That's German. <laughs> Sie Deutsch. Um, so you, you come to like a thing when you're kind of in the target range because it sort of hits all the spots that it's trying to hit, right? Yeah, sure. Um, but then as you get older, um, you know, I've sort of found that there are certain things about anime that like, okay, I'm not really into that anymore. If there's a new series that's like very shonen, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not really that into it because it's like it just doesn't appeal to me. So the anymore would be the key word there. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, exactly, anymore. I've sort of grown out of some of the things. That being said, there are certain anime that I still really do like um, for a number of reasons. For one, I like some of the premises. You know, being an RPG fan, I find that there are certain, sometimes a premise to a, a show that's like really super cool and make an awesome RPG. Yeah. And that concept is kind of what keeps me hooked, at least for a little while. Um, there are also sometimes um, shows that take these sort of traditional... Um, like, here's what a generic shonen looks like, and we're going to put a spin on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes, like, a, a parody or a, a genre deconstruction, that sort of thing. Um, I recently watched uh, Madoka Magica. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Which is a genre deconstruction of the magical girl genre. Uh, you know, a big example of that being the Sailor Moon series, mm-hmm. where you've got... Um, and I, I understand that Sailor Moon's kind of got some darker, more mature themes in it, too, especially, um, like, the original Japanese manga that didn't necessarily translate to the U.S. um, TV show. Uh, But what Madoka Magica does is take kind of, like, the cute girl power, yay, fun (laughs) sort of aesthetic, um, but then add this really dark element of um, people sort of stuck in the system that they they don't have any power over and eventually, like, having to, you know, this is... A bit of a spoiler, but uh, you know. So if you don't, if you care to see Madoka Magica and haven't already heard about this, uh, ter- uh, avert your ears for a moment. Uh, but uh, <laughs> la, 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 when you become a magical girl, basically you enter into a contract that you're eventually going to turn into a witch, which is what magical girls are meant to fight. And so it's this endless cycle of they recruit new magical girls to fight witches, who themselves then become the witches Ooh, that new magical girls are fighting. That's so dark. Um, it's, it's a very, and like, there's like some bloody scenes in it and stuff like that. Like a decapitation happens at one point. I mean, it's, uh, it's not like a cutesy show, <laughs> right. um, but that's, what's fascinating about it to me is the fact that it sort of takes this familiar concept and does something more mature with it. Oh, see, I totally play that video game. Yeah. There you go. I think. Um, and so the, the point here being that, um, your, your tastes as you get older tend to change. And then you have people around your age who haven't necessarily grown up with the thing that you like, uh, say, for example, anime, um, who sometimes people will be open-minded about it, but other times they'll look at it and they'll see all the things that you sort of brush off as being you know, just part of the genre um, that they can't get over. They can't brush off because it's like, this is weird, this is childish, you know, whatever it is that you want to say about it. Um, and you then you either try to convince them that like oh here's why you might like it or you know you have to get you kind of feel like you have to get defensive. Uh, if I had a quarter for every time <laughs> somebody has said no 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 you can't hate a genre yeah uh, um, and so and that's not to say too like yeah I'm sure if Jim was here he would make the point that anime is a form and not inherently a genre and you know but, what I would give him that mm-hmm. argument but I would also make the statement. I don't like horror mm-hmm. as a genre. Mm-hmm. I'm not a fan. However, whenever the new season of Walking Dead comes out, I hit it. Mm-hmm. Every time. I really do. Granted, it's on Netflix and a year later, because mm-hmm. uh, I'm not willing to, mm-hmm. to go week to week on it. But I'll binge it. Mm-hmm. I will. And every now and then I'll get in the mood for, for something kind of creepy, and especially the psychological stuff, mm-hmm. or something that has to do about time-traveling phone calls mm-hmm. or something. I, yeah, I'm all over it. Mm-hmm. I just... I'm not a Freddy Krueger kind of guy. Sure, yeah. So going back to anime for a second, though, like if you want kind of a case in point of, you know, it's meant for kids as much as people try to combat that notion. Um, it, and I, I don't, like, I'd have to verify this with a few uh, different sources, but my understanding that I've heard from a few different people is that in Japan, anime is for kids. Like, cool people, adults, you know, whatever it is, 
don't get into anime and the people who are really into anime, the otaku, are weird, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, just like, you know, some people here in the U.S. would consider adult fans of anime uh, to be a bit weird. And, you know, there's also something to be said, you know, without getting too off track that, you know, if you like a thing, you're free to like it. You know, it's like you're, you're free to like or dislike whatever you want. Everyone has their own tastes and really there's no reason to be ashamed over any of it, you know? Um, but, you know, the point here being that um, as are we, an are we still talking about anime? Because I'm thinking shame is <laughs> is an option. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm derailing you again. Um, but um, yeah, it's just as as an audience ages, the people who grew up liking a thing are likely to keep liking it, even if for different reasons. Whereas people who didn't grow up with it won't have that leaning. Um, and very quickly to sort of tie in my Sonic example, um, I grew up liking Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, but when I look at the newer games that have come out, you can definitely tell that um, between the aesthetic and you know, like the the musical stylings and the premise and all this different stuff, you know, Sonic is a series meant for kids. You know, like sort of early teens, you know, preteens, that sort of age group. Um, and you know, even if you still appreciate the gameplay and stuff like that, there's a lot about the presentation of Sonic that comes across as kind of kiddie. Um, and you know, someone who um, you show an old Sonic game that you really loved when you were at that target age and try to convince them. It's like, oh man, no, this is a really great game. You should play it. And they don't like it. It's kind of understandable that as an adult who did not grow up with it, um, they're not going to find the same sort of appeal as you do. And I think a lot of that has to do with nostalgia and with um, sort of having acquired that taste already. Oh yeah. What's the phrase you used before? Nostalgia glasses? Uh, I don't think I use that one, but it's, uh, it is applicable. Oh, okay. So. Um, well, I mean, I would say something like um, the Zelda series applies to this. Mm. In my opinion, I'm a huge fan of Zelda. Haven't played one in years. Mm. It's quite possible I haven't played a new Zelda in a decade. Mostly because I, he's a package character. I know what I'm going to get. Mm-hmm. You know, it, It's all the same elements, recycled. They're not bad games. I just... I, I've done that. Mm-hmm. I'm not really interested in in the new repackaged Zelda from this new thing. Honestly, the, the last one that I played uh, and really enjoyed was Four Swords, mm-hmm. uh, mostly because it was wow, v- 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 lots of lots of links together mm-hmm. in one space. This is cool. This is original. This is new. Yeah, um, and I think um, you know, kind of tying into you know, Zelda is a good example of this, and also we touched. Um, last time on the Mario episode on um, like the original Super Mario Bros. And I mentioned that I personally wasn't a huge fan of the original Super Mario Bros. going back and playing it now. Yeah. Um, because I grew up with a slightly newer iteration. And so whereas someone who, uh, say like Jim, um, really like played and enjoyed the original Legend of Zelda and the original Mario Bros. And they do hold up in their own way. But for me, who didn't grow up with those titles but grew up on slightly newer titles... Um, those to me feel too old and too clunky to really want to get into. You know, I can appreciate them for what they are and what they were, but um, it's just like it's something where because I don't have that experience of like really loving the games as they were then, um, right. I I can't get over some of the retro clunkiness. You mm-hmm. know, um, and that's nothing against those games. It's just a personal taste thing. That's a very good point. Well, you know, one of my favorite games as a kid was Lost Vikings. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about it was that the three Vikings each had a different ability. There was a puzzle game, all of that. But you know what? It doesn't hold up. It just does not survive the test of time. The graphics are terrible. The music is terrible. The gameplay is really not that interesting now. Um, But for the time, it was something really groundbreaking, interesting. And, and, I mean, it was a Blizzard game, Mm -hmm. you know? And it was cool. I think it was for Super Nintendo. And... It just you, you stick that cartridge in nowadays, and it's kind of like, look at this weird artifact. And that's all. Mm-hmm. It has historical value, but not much gameplay value, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and of course, if you have someone who, like, you know, played it then and, like, loved it, loved it, loved it, and like still kind of appreciates it. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was an, the, the kind of you know, on that same note and coming back to... Um, uh, like going back to the Sonic example I cited earlier, uh, I think it was um, the YouTuber Pro Jared um, who does like you know uh, let's plays of video games and stuff like that. He did a thing where he basically went back and 
um, did a review, so to speak, of Sonic Adventure 2, mm-hmm. which is what a lot of uh, Sonic fans will cite as like one of the 3D games that was actually pretty good. And actually, I kind of agree with that. Um, but what he did is he was going through the review and looking at it with fresh new eyes and it's like, this game's pretty terrible. <laughs> like, there are like occasionally like levels that were pretty cool, even if they had like a few little flaws here and there, but like, you know, this whole set of levels was terrible. Uh, like the audio mixing here was terrible, like all this <laughs> different stuff. It's like, it's stuff that like I still notice and like, I'm like, yeah, no, the audio is terrible there, that sort of thing. Um, the story can like, it, it, like sort of on paper, if you summarize it, it's interesting, but like actually played out it's uh, kind of terrible, <laughs> you know, it's like uh-huh. actually like the, the playing out of said story. Um, and the point that he made that I thought was kind of interesting is that um, he was talking about the Chow Garden, which is the thing where you get to raise these little virtual pets and you collect items in the levels as you play through that you can then feed to these pets to okay. power them up. And what that causes you to do is go back and play levels again and then again and again to get ah, those items. Yes. But what you do is you go back and you play the levels you liked. And so what your brain has kind of done is you've played the same levels that you loved over and over again and in a way sort of shut out all the memories of the stuff that wasn't so great. Um, now, personally, like, I didn't have the same sorts of problems that some people had with certain levels. I thought that they were kind of cool in their own way. Um, but I can definitely see the argument there that, like, we liked a third of the game and we remember that third of the game so fondly that we can go back and be like, oh, man, this game is so awesome, or not understand when someone else plays it with 100% of the game, not just that third, saying, um, this game is two-thirds terrible. That makes it a terrible game. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I think we could make that argument for any media form. Mm-hmm. There's, there's films that don't hold up that same way, TV shows, that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the thing that I always am wary of is whenever somebody says, you got to watch this show, it's a great show, but stick with it mm-hmm. until X, mm-hmm. or you can skip X, mm-hmm. um, you know, that kind of a thing. I mean, I literally had someone just today say mm-hmm. that about the uh, the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a big, you know, reversal or, or twist about halfway through the first season. Mm-hmm. So here's the specific episodes that you should watch up until that and skip the rest and do the other. You know, I'm I'm kind of a teetotaler. Mm-hmm. Nobody uses that word anymore, but basically <laughs> it means all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. And so if I'm going to watch something, if I'm going to binge something, I'm going to obsess. Mm. And I I mean, honestly, I had a hard time getting into Doctor Who whenever it rebooted mm-hmm. just because I was like I want to watch all the old stuff. I've never gotten into Doctor Who. <laughs> and, and well, the thing is I didn't understand fundamentally that you can't watch all the old stuff. Mm. Half of it doesn't exist, mm. half of it is not released, and that which is isn't really fundamental to the new parts of the show and when it is reintroduced in in the new one it it's reintroduced in such a way that it it's contextualized for the new stuff Mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah so it's the same way with like star trek um now i know you're not a huge fan of the original star trek not so much but i i like the original star trek Mm -hmm. uh, but i also like you know next generation and Which I like. I've, I've seen a few episodes I kind of enjoyed of that, but they're also like I, I tried just watching the series at one point and couldn't get myself to keep going with yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that and that and that's actually totally fine and it makes sense mm-hmm. because, you know, I consider myself to be a Trekkie, but you were, uh, you, you are not, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I think a lot of that has to do with that um, generational love because I'm perfectly willing to admit that the reason I like the original Star Trek is I watched it with my dad on VHS. Mm-hmm. You know, we went to the library of all places. We had a pretty cool library when mm-hmm. I was a kid. Um, and, and actually, I was a teenager. But um, and we would go down to the library and we'd pick up these episodes of the original series. It had two on each video. Nice. Um, because that's back whenever buying a whole series of something. There were very, very few that were on VHS. But mm-hmm. those that were, like... Star Trek it was super expensive. It was like a hundred bucks yeah. for, for the series, um, and so we, you know, we would uh, we would watch these together, and that's the reason why I've got that emotional connection mm-hmm. to it is because it reminds me of my dad. Yeah, you know, same kind of experience with the Next Generation, um, but at least for me, that was. I mean, I watched those before I watched the original ones, honestly, because mm-hmm. uh, I watched those as a kid, but. When I go back and I watch them, I remember having watched them the first time. I remember the experience of first experiencing it. Mm-hmm. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, 
is if you come in either as a fresh user, somebody like, oh, someone who's never seen Babylon 5 and tries to go back and watch those fresh, oh, that's hard. Mm. That is super, super hard. Uh, because it's early 90s animation, and it's <laughs> just bad. I wish somebody would go in and do a special edition of that, honestly. Kick it into HD, uh, redo the, all the, the computer animation, that kind of a thing. Hmm. But I would never pawn that off on anybody. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a decent series. Mm. I, you know, I watched it. It wasn't my favorite, but I watched it. But I would never, mm. never try to get somebody into yeah. it. Like, I can sort of see, too, and this, um, I think, compares, like, sci-fi as sort of a genre that a lot of people from the outside looking in can't really appreciate. That's a good point. A lot like, you know, sort of stereotypical anime. Mm -hmm. um, even video games to an extent. A lot of people in just society see video games in a different way than gamers do. Uh, they see it as Ooh, good pretty, point. Much, pretty much just as... Um, FPS is where people scream at each other on the internet. Yeah, that's where um, we get into the misconceptions about computer vi or game violence yeah. and um, that kind of a thing. Yeah. But, you know, you can sort of, you know, people who appreciate the same sorts of things as you, you can recommend to them. Um, like, you know, as someone who likes some anime but not most, you know, just because as I got older, like, there are very specific series that I can appreciate, like, the, the best of the best are the mm -hmm. ones I like. But I won't get into just, like, random anime you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, I can talk to other people who also like anime and they can recommend the best ones, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you go to someone who likes science fiction, especially maybe older science fiction, you say, hey, have you ever seen Babylon 5? Here's why Babylon 5 was great. Even if it's something that, like, they understand going into it that has a lot of problems because of its age mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, um, you can sort of gauge whether or not they would like it. That makes sense. But trying to get people who again, didn't grow up with it or don't have those fun memories or just don't even, you know, say it's not even about aging. It's just about personal taste. That's true, too. Um, just don't get into what it is that you're into. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. Well, I'm, and I'm not a fan of um, Metal Gear. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. A lot of it has to do with the aesthetic mm -hmm. of the, um, the anime aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But it also has to do partly with the the fact that I didn't play the earlier games. I haven't been indoctrinated with the world. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't feel like I know that world. I would be learning it as I went. Yeah. And, and, while, and while there is something to be said for, like, you can play the game for it as a game, you know, and not need to know the story. I mean, half of my enjoyment in Metal Gear comes from the story, you know? Right. Um, and so, you know, Metal Gear without the story is... A good, you know, tactical stealth game. Yeah. But, you know, like, tactical stealth isn't my, like, that's that's my genre. You know, it's it's something that I appreciate because it's well done in Metal Gear and because I love the story. I tried very, very hard to pr play the prelude. Mm. Ground uh, Zeroes? Gra yeah. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. Mm. There were a couple of reasons that I couldn't do it. But not the least of which is, I'm with that gameplay, the mm. way that it is, I went into GTA mode. Mm-hmm. And so I was hijacking Jeeps, uh, I was shooting people, and I was going, ooh, that's a very big gun, I want to shoot it. I like stealth games, mm -hmm. I do. I couldn't do it in that one. Mm -hmm. I found myself impatient and unable to, to do what I was supposed to do in mm -hmm. those moments. I actually had no problem at all killing the, the first guy in the watchtower mm. and just moving on past him until I realized he was a Marine. Mm. And suddenly, him being a U.S. Marine, I was like, what am I doing? Am I some mm. kind of weird terrorist? What's going on here? Because mm. I didn't have the backstory yeah. of he's this elite... Uh, Mercenary. You know, yeah, yeah and, and he exists outside mm. of the government mm. and mm. above them, and mm. even the U.S. is doing questionable things. Yeah, like this is a black site. It's not actually right. authorized. I didn't have any of that content. Context. Yeah. So for me, it was I went and I killed a U.S. Marine. Mm -hmm. I'm out. Yeah. And that's also one of those things too, where um, you know, it's like I think I think that might actually be the first time in an MGS game where you're actually fighting Americans. And it's not to say that like other countries haven't had issues. Like uh, fighting the Soviets is a big thing in right. Phantom Pain. And so I'm sure Russians might have some like you know um, reservations about fighting Soviets. Mm -hmm. But what was encouraging about it to me is that MGS has always been a series that. Um, not only allows, but actually through their point system encourages you not to do kill yeah. or not to kill anyone. And so, in that sense, um, I, I didn't have any qualms with going into this U.S. military base because I knew I didn't have to kill anyone, mm -hmm. um, which is something cool about MGS. But um, yeah, no, I, I definitely see where you're coming from there. Yeah, 
So I I had the same problem with it that I had with uh, Deus Ex. Mm. And I think the Deus Ex that I played was um, Human, Human Revolution. Human Revolution, mm. which, which admittedly was, was panned by a lot of people. Mm. Because they outsourced the boss fights, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you had to go aggressive on those. Yeah. Um, but basically, the problem that I had with it was they say you can do it one or two ways, but you really kind of can't. Mm. You you really only have two options: the way they expect you to do it stealthily, or make a lot of noise and shoot a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the way that I felt about Metal Gear. I mean, it said it said something about um, you can go through this gate if you want to. I can never figure out how to do that. Mm. You have to go up to it and hold X to lockpick it. But see that there, that wasn't that there. wasn't even a pop up. That wasn't it. No, I don't. Mm. Well, may, maybe it was, but um, if so, I missed it. Oh, you're talking about the the big gate with the, this is a big security the gate. The very yeah. beginning. Oh, of the... oh, at the very beginning. Yeah, that one's that's the one you have to pick. Okay. Um, there's also a way like you can climb a cliff and go around it. Um, but yeah, I figured that out. Okay. That's what I ended up actually doing. Cool, cool. But, um, then I then I dropped down and I got spotted, and <laughs> then the firefight began. So yeah. I mean, um, it, and, and it, sometimes in Metal Gear, it's like not so much. Like you can more so than you ever could. Now you can actually go in guns blazing and just do like hard and heavy. Yeah, kill everything, finish the mission, get out. Um, but um, what they tend to encourage you to do, I think, just through the mechanics, is if you get caught and you have to fight your way out of it, you fight until you can hide, and then they call off the search eventually and then you go back into stealth mode for as long as you can yeah. but um yeah so it's just one of those things where it's it's a it's a series that um has a lot of history to it and um you know sometimes uh people play it for the first time even without context and just fall in love with it sometimes people don't and you know it's just a matter of taste sometimes but. yeah well that makes a lot of sense actually um so i guess a, a topic i want to touch on here as we start to sort of wind it down is the idea of a maturing audience and um, from a, a perspective of all different media, um, you know, whether it be TV or books or movies or games, uh, what have you, um, what it is that kind of defines a more mature um, taste as far as storytelling goes. Um, you know, there's kind of in a way, you know, say for instance with, um, you know, books and stuff like that for young adults, they tend to be coming of age stories because it's what the, the aud- intended audience can relate to the most easily. You know, um, they're going through these sort of adolescent angsty struggles, you know, um, just <laughs> yeah. like the characters in the books. And so they relate to it. And I think that has a big, a big part to do with it is like empathizing with the characters, understanding what they're going through because you have some related experience, but, um, you know, with adults, I'm sure like there's certain things like parenthood, if you're a parent, um, but you know, not all adults are parents. Um, well, probably, probably things to do with not all um, parents are adults either. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, the idea that you have like responsibility thrust upon you and you don't necessarily know what to do with it, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, what is it you think that sort of separates, say a adult audience from, um, you know, children or teen or whatever else? Oh man. Well, you know, I recently watched Fight Club, mm. but strangely enough, I did it for an assignment <laughs> because I wanted to key into the theme in that film about being the the middle generation of history, mm. uh, not really having anything to fight for, a generation of men being raised by women, this idea that comes through in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I don't think it's about a, a, a gender thing necessarily mm-hmm. at all, but I think there are lots of... 40-year-old boys mm. out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I think that the difference between being an adult, truly being an adult, and, and being uh, a child in a, an adult body comes down to what, uh, where you see your, your center of control. In your life, are you, you know, is my life out of control or am I in control? Do I have do I have kind of a, a trajectory that I'm headed towards? Mm-hmm. And we we try to be quite academic here. Mm-hmm. So in that regard, we know a lot of academics, and in that regard, we know a lot of people who know where they're going with their life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that we probably know a lot of very mature gamers. I think we we have some discerning tastes and the guests that we have on here have some discerning tastes. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's a fair statement to say that a lot of people 
they just want the the basic escapism. Yeah. You know, and and I think that's where it comes down to. Why do you play the games you play? Why do you watch the movies you watch? Why do you watch the shows you watch? Do you do it because it you don't want to have to think about complicated narratives or you just want to shoot stuff? Mm-hmm. Or is it because you like the complexities of the reversal and mm-hmm. actually having an ironic twist at the end and discovering that the love story played out a different way than you thought it would and that kind of a thing? Mm-hmm. And that's where I am with the, with my gaming. I, I'd much rather be on a rail and and experience a developer story than be given so much freedom that the story gets lost in the haze. Mm. And that's, to me, the difference between something like one of my favorite games, um, Odyssey to the West, Enslaved Odyssey to the West, which is very much on a rail. It's minor RPG elements, but um, it's got a great story that comes from classic Chinese literature. Mm. Um, you compare that to, to something like... Um, uh, well, even even Metal Gear, um, to me, I I can't get behind that story. Hmm. That's that's tricky for me. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it is a fairly unapproachable story. You know, yeah. Like, I, well, that's the, what I mean. Yeah. At, at its surface, it is about a lone soldier who's sent on a like impossible mission and has to survive it. See, that sounds um, brilliant. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Which is actually very much the plot of Metal Gear Solid One. Right, um, and also three because that was that character's first big story. Ah, sure. Um, and those those themes carry through, but each time you kind of get to a sequel for a given character, say you know going from Elder Solid One with Solid Snake to two and then to yeah. four, yeah. versus with um, Big Boss starting in three and going on from there. Um, you know the themes change because it's no longer just about. Uh, you know, in Metal Gear Solid 1 it wasn't Snake's first mission mm-hmm. but it's most people's introduction to it and therefore it is the mission that is about surviving you know yeah sure um, I mean you have a goal but you very quickly start to find that um, what you were told and what you're kind of expecting there are so many things that are different about it that now you are kind of just like on your own and confused mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. a big theme of that game um, and it's great I loved it. Um, but there's also a lot of context that um, if I hadn't played through that game, I wouldn't get half of what was going on in 2 or in 4. And 4 right. especially. 4 is a terrible game to get introduced with. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was actually my first point of entry, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah. Well, compare that to something like Last of Us, mm. which uh, very quickly sets up the world, very quickly sets up the characters. But the truth is, it's extremely linear, and it's kind of samey all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um some people are going to be really turned off by that. Other people are going to think it's other people's. Mm. Other people's is going to think that it's the, <laughs> the, the, guys. the, the pinnacle of all gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I know people who, uh, professors, who would say that this is the greatest game ever and that all games should be this. And I'm going, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. No, that's completely wrong. There is a spectrum between uh, the, the story that the developer is telling in the story that you yourself mm-hmm. get to tell as an emergent property of having yeah, agency yeah. within the gameplay a great example i heard about the last of us that kind of illustrates um that that term that sounds super pretentious uh and yet is useful for some discussions ludonarrative dissonance where in the Ooh. story they're telling you because it's post-apocalyptic um there's all this scarcity and you're scraping by to survive and you have to do all these like really morally ambiguous things to get through and yet um as you're mowing down all these people with your gun they keep dropping ammo and you never run out of ammo that's right it's like in a game about scarcity shouldn't you feel like you like have to save every single bullet yeah no kidding um that's a great example and so it's 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 interesting in that way you know how Mm -hmm. sometimes the gameplay and the story don't quite mesh yeah but you know what there are times I, I, will, I will backtrack just a little bit and say there are times whenever all I want to do is have a complete escapist mm-hmm. um, weekend of gaming sure. with no real narrative mm-hmm. and just engage in the mechanics yeah, and have fun. Play for fun. And yeah. that's what I did last weekend with Grow Home. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I did. It was cute. It was kind of funny. It was a little bit samey, but it was absolutely brilliant because mm-hmm. it was fresh. Nice. Whereas for me, like right now, I don't find myself in the mood for games like that. You know, mm-hmm. like I'd probably enjoy it if you made me sit down with it for a while, but it wouldn't be something that would appeal to me as like I might play it for five or ten minutes and be like, okay, cool, I'm good. Yeah. Like with all the other stuff I have to do, if I'm going to sit down for um, any sort of entertainment, I want it to be something that's really deep and pro- thought provoking and, um, you know, engaging. Yeah. Um, and not in just in like a fun sort of engaging. Mario. Way. No. 
<laughs> I probably like, wouldn't get that much into Mario right now, honestly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but you know, Mario Maker, for example, which is a little bit more creative, that I might get into because it's a creative exercise. So I think so. I'm going to change my answer. Okay, I, I'm going to say that a mature uh, adult gamer, someone who understands why they game and can uh, both snack and binge mm-hmm. along a, a lots of different types of game genres and appreciate them for the various types that they are. I think that um, someone who just likes a very specific type of game, mm. nothing wrong with that, might arguably be a two-dimensional type of gamer. Mm. Not to be confused with gamers who like two-dimensional games. Fair enough. Um, and I think you know if we sort of relate that back one more time to media in general, um, perhaps going back to um, you know the anime example, among other things, um, and a more adult audience member of stuff like that that's kind of often targeted for younger people. Um, they're like, we, without going into too much detail right now, there are a lot of things I could list off that tell you, say, Shonen is meant for young boys. Right. Um, younger boys. Um, we can sort of go to those things that interest us for very particular reasons because we're kind of just like wanting something to snack on. We mm-hmm. want something that's mm-hmm. fun and exciting and simple um, and not necessarily something that is, uh, you know, Shakespeare. Right. That sort of thing. Exactly. Uh, and so we can kind of pick and choose, as you said, someone who is able to go to the thing they want because they know what it is they want. Yeah. The discerning gourmet. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that you can't be young and like, you know, when you're young, you've only got one taste. It's yeah. just that um, you might be, uh, you also don't have the taste for some of the more sophisticated things a lot of times. Well, you don't have the experience for it necessarily. Yeah. And, and to put it another way, uh, you can you can still su- stomach the sugar mm-hmm. when you're a kid. Yeah, that's a good way to put you it. You know, and and as Go, uh, going back to the uh, game candy thing. Yeah, that's right, game yeah. candy. You know, um, as as I get older, there's just stuff that I just can't stomach anymore, mm-hmm. and I wish I could. Mm-hmm. I actually genuinely have a nostalgia nostalgia glasses mm-hmm. for these old games that I wish I could experience again and feel again mm-hmm. like I used to, and I just can't. Yeah, it's just gone. Mm-hmm. So enjoy it while you're young, kids. <laughs> Now they all tuned out, like, yeah. hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> we all die someday. Yeah. And on that cheery note, uh, I think we're going to just go ahead and wrap up this episode. So, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 46 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. Like what you like. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your experiences with growing out of various media, and what you do and don't like about them now. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.